You must have all noticed that uh, the book has been translated into 39 language. I think Tamina mentioned that earlier as well. Possibly the most translated book ever published by a Pakistani author. Um, if we can digress just a little. Um, I read that you had uh, taken up painting during that period as well, and you had an exhibition which you, um, I think, titled Catharsis. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Was that part of the healing process, getting over what you had been through, uh, or was that just something that you were interested in doing? The, the title of the, of the exhibition clearly indicates otherwise. I think, Shahid, so when there was so much inside, just writing a book or expressing it in words just didn't seem to me enough. I wanted to express there was still something left to say, and you find different forms of expression. Painting and writing are just two of them. I needed to, there was still something that I was required to tell, and that I was, I think, I was able to, you know, take out of myself in painting. My paintings were dark and shrouded, and there were lots of women, chadars, and no men at all. And so I was, you know, able to um, express something. I had the first exhibit. I've always been interested in painting, and I think I am an artist. So it was something I enjoyed doing as well. But there was still a leftover, some rudiment after my feudal lord, and I think that came out in catharsis. It so, was very much part of the same. Right. Uh, so it was another phase. form. It was yes. another form of expression yes, for yes, what you felt. Of the same thing. Now your second book uh, was actually an oral autobiography, uh, as narrated. It says as narrated uh, to Tamina Durrani. It's uh, uh, the autobiography of, and it's an authorized autobiography of uh, Maulana Abdul Sattar Edi. Um, it has a very enigmatic title, A Mirror to the Blind. Um, can you tell us something about this book, what, what moved you in this very different direction after My Feudal Lord? I do not think that I'll ever do a more important work than writing Abdul Sattar Eidhi's book. <laughs> the fact that today I am an authority to speak on a man like Abdul Sattar Eidhi, the fact that I approached him after my feudal lord and was at that time known as the writer of my feudal lord and oh God, be careful of this woman. You know, she's not the right kind of woman. Uh, Mr. Evi accepted me just so completely. Thank you. He, he just, you know, there was something that I think he, um, of course, is such a connected man. He recognized that maybe something about me that I didn't even have to tell him. And the fact that the writer of my feudal lord has written the authorized, official, narrated autobiography of the most revered man in our country, the most exceptional human being that perhaps Currently, the Muslim world today has. There is no, ex there, there is no example of another man like Edi. A lifetime struggle without a day's holiday. Not one night's sleep without the emergency phone next to him that he picks up himself still today. He is now 90 and has spent his entire life in the service of our people. He has taken no money from, no funds from any foreign agency, any aid agency, donor agencies, governments, our government. Uh, the Vatican has tried to give him aid, the World Bank, um, um, IMF. Mr. Idi has only taken money from the people of Pakistan. Mr. Idi's... Uh, you were asking about the title. Yes. The title was A Mirror to the Blind. I mean, it's quite clear what it means. 
that I don't think that we expected anybody to really understand what he's saying because he was showing a mirror but the people were blind they couldn't see what was this man saying this man is not just a social worker I spent three years with him I lived in Idi home I spent time going to buy fish in the fish market buying fruit with Bilkis for the entire Eidi foundation which she uh, still purchases herself and I tied coffins on babies, dead babies, bathed them, you know, abandoned children, uh, spent a lot of time in the um, in Surab Ghot where all the psychologically uh, damaged children are and uh, traveled with him to Kandahar, Balochistan, so the three-year period in which I had to leave my own children. And um, that three-year period was the university of life. It was the university of another kind of life, life I wasn't born into, but a life I had to see uh, firsthand to be able to recognize the distance between the people and the state I knew about politics at the higher level. I understood that the people came to rallies and they came to, you know, places like this. And so all leaders talked about people. But Mr. Edi took me right down into their problems, into mm, how he was solving them. And just to tell you one thing before I end this uh, answer, is that just to understand Mr. Edi and his love for mankind and his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, connection, a universal connection he has with all people all over the world. When he was asked about why he picks up these illegitimate children who are thrown and he's provided cradles to them and he, wants, he takes, says don't kill them, it is no fault of theirs, just give them to me. Um, a lot of people reacted, the mullahs reacted, there was, you know, death threats on Mr. Eidi for doing something so un-Islamic. And he said something incredible, he said, there is no such thing as an illegitimate human being. So Mr. Eidi is a subject that we can go on about, but you, I think... In That's incredibly subject. inspiring, uh, Temina. Thank you so much for that. Uh, now, if we can move on to your next work, uh, which was, in some sense, a step back to what you had earlier written about, except this time you chose to write a work of fiction, hmm. a novel by the title of Blasphemy. Um, again, a very personal story, one woman's tale of hardship and woe, and her deliverance. Um, but it's also based on a true story, as the preface says, um, she is unable to change the society and what she has suffered and what made her suffer still stays as it is. Um, would you like to talk about that? Well, firstly, I think I'd like to make clear that the reason for calling it blasphemy was that my own understanding of what was happening in my religion and what and the story I was told and I what even the story although it's a huge you know very deep and very unique kind of story we can think but at some level some aspects of it are in everybody's life um, to me if you can dis when you distort the word of the holy quran and when you exploit the work of the prophet that's blasphemy i mean what could be more what could be more blasphemous than to change everything that God had said and the Prophet had given to us. So I saw that 
I continue to see it in different, at different levels, the distortion. And, I, and for me, you know, I begin to immediately recognize it as something that is not acceptable more uh, rather than, you know, the things we pick up and connect to this word. Uh, although it was about one woman, I was happier to write it uh, without really naming her and without fictionalize and by fictionalizing it, I had to do that to protect her. But it was about the system I was talking. In my feudal lord, unfortunately, I was not able to talk about the system. It, I, it, everybody just said it was about her, and it was about him, and it was about so and so. No, it was the system I was talking about. But because the people were relevant and current, and uh, uh, everybody knew them, so they just, you know, said so and so is like this. The rest is all fine. So and so is like this. No, everybody else is not like this. No, it wasn't like that. Feudalism is an attitude, it's a mindset. And the hypocrisy in our society is deeply rooted. The contradictions, the complications, the, you know, having to live for other, just to show other people. Um, <clears throat> in blasphemy, I was able to write about the system of Piri Muriti, about the system of what a religious you know, a medieval religious cult was able to do and how many people they controlled because it's a captive vote bank, 70% of your population. So that was what was important. And as far as this uh, last part of your question is that how do you break the chain? I think we first have to understand what's happening to break any chain. So I'm just telling you a story, and I'm sure that in time, uh, awareness will evolve us towards being able to break that change. But we, when we have seen and we have understood, we will begin to reject, and the more and more people who are able to see this will reject. And when you reject something, then you move on, you move forward. Otherwise, you're there. You know, we maintain the status quo. So the chain, I think, is a process.